morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with all of you today. A few quick announcements to let you know about some things going on in the life of our church. I will be the first. Mary Elizabeth, welcome back. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we've been missing you. We're so glad to have you back with us. A few announcements um, to let you guys know some things that are coming up in the life of the church. Uh, Wednesday, we will have our communion service at 1215. Uh, we would love for you to come and be a part of that. Also, on Thursday at 9 a.m. in the Wesson, we will gather for our morning Bible study. We have been having new visitors come to that Bible study, and the conversation is rich. The fellowship is deep, and the food is full of sugar and brown, uh, brown cinnamon. We would love to have you come and to be a part uh, of that time, 9 o'clock on Thursday. All guests and visitors are welcome. You can talk as much as you want, or you can be silent. It's just a good time of, of fellowship. Also know that this weekend we have two really amazing events that are going to be unfolding for the members of our church. Um, on Saturday at 7 a.m. at the Phoenicia, I think I'm saying that right, the restaurant, the Methodist men are having a, uh, a time of fellowship, 7 a.m. for breakfast, uh, to come down and be a part of that. Uh, they had a great turnout a couple months ago, and I think they're trying to make that an every first Sunday, uh, Saturday of the month event. That'll be Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, 7 a.m. at the Phoenicia. And then on Sunday uh, at 2 o'clock here in the Wesson Building, uh, our United, uh, our Women in Faith, United Methodist Women in Faith, are going to gather from 2 to 4 o'clock uh, for a Valentine tea. They would love to have all the ladies in the congregation come and be a part of that. We thank so many of our membership who are working hard to put on those events and grow that time uh, of fellowship. So we hope that you will be a part of that opportunity uh, as well. So, Amen. Thank you. 
affirmation of faith. It's printed in your bulletin and also found on page 881 in the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. the children's moment. Do we have children here? <gasps> Come on down. Come on down. Eliza, I think, has the box today. Oh, wait, Cora, do you have the box? She does. All right, come on over. Let me have your box. Eliza, you can bring yours next week. Is that okay? You want to leave it by your mom, and then we can, we can, you have it next week, and then we'll pass it around. <gasps> you okay? I do that all the time, all the time. It's okay. Come sit. How are y'all doing? You look so pretty today. Did you have a good week? Yes? All right, it's time for the surprise. What's in that box? Do you want to you wanna open it and pull it out, or do you want me to? It's up to you. Okay. Oh, it's a book. It's a book. Let me see what your book says. And a flower, so not just one. We have multiple children, children's objects. Let's see here. Okay, oh, that's a live flower. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. And let's see what else. Can I see your book? Okay. Oh, the little green frog. All right, I think there's a story about that in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> little green frog. I love that. Do you like this book? Is this your favorite book? Yes. You like to read, right? I love that. Okay, you know what my favorite book is? <gasps> Take a guess. Guess, what book, what book is important to the church? About Jesus. Who's that again? About Jesus. That's right. Love reading about Jesus. What is the book called that's all about Jesus? Eliza, do you know that? The Bible. The Bible. That's right. The Bible. The Bible is my favorite book. I read lots of other books, but my, the Bible is my favorite book. And as far as this flower goes, you know what it reminds me of? That in the Bible, sometimes God talks about his people being like a garden, like a beautiful garden. Do you know you're all like flowers in the garden of God? Isn't that lovely to think of? You can see your friends and your parents and everybody, and you can close your eyes and imagine them as this beautiful garden that God is watching over, and he's tending to it, and he's watering it, and he's taking really good care of it. How do you guys like that idea, being a flower in God's garden? I love it. All right, well, let's pray that God will continue to take care of us and tend his garden, okay? Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much that we are your handiwork, and each one of us is uniquely crafted, just like each flower is very different. They look the same on the surface, but they're really very different when you look at the details. And I thank you so much for these children, for their parents, the grandparents, for the choir, for everyone who is a part of God's garden. Lord, we love you. Thank you for watering us, for tending up to us, and for taking such good care of us. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that. 
We have children's church today. You see Miss Nicole at the back. If you guys want to go to children's church, she's going to take care of you today, okay? All right. All right. Thank you so much for bringing that box. You want it? Can I have it now? You're going to take it, you're going to take it home with you? <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm, going to let, I'm going to let Eliza do the box next week. Thank you so much. God bless our children. The prayer requests and the praises that arise in the midst of the congregation. And, and I would like to just start off by saying that I got a, a text this morning from Carrie Parisich, and Tom is still in the hospital. They are getting his biopsy results back tomorrow, probably. And so they said, so far it looks like something that is treatable, maybe even curable. So we praise God for that. So keep Tom and Carrie in your prayers. And are there any other prayer requests from the congregation this morning? Bobby Sawyer. Bobby Sawyer, that's right. Richard's brother. He is still undergoing diagnosis or treatment for? Surgery next week. Surgery next week um, for Bobby. So please keep the Sawyers in your prayers as well. Anyone else? Chester? 15 months ago, we asked to have... Lindsay Kimball put on the prayer list. She was here 15 years, 15 uh, months ago, and delivered the last of Zach's eulogies. Little did she know when she went back to Manhattan that the doctors told her that she was going to have to have a heart transplant, or he had no idea how long that she would make it and put her on the heart transplant list. Yesterday, she got a call after lunch that a tissue match had occurred and that she needed to get to the hospital immediately uh -huh. to be sure that it would, would work. By midnight, she had already been prepped, went through the operation, and woke this morning after coming out of surgery with a new heart and a new life. Oh, Amen. praise God for that. That's amazing. We talked about this uh, in our uh, study Bible study group uh, several months ago, and I mentioned it to them, and we were talking about miracles that happened. This was a miracle. Yeah. Oh. God does uh, produce miracles, Amen. but certainly she is not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, but she's doing quite well, and if you will please keep her in your prayers, we would greatly appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chester. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Susan? I would like to say that it's a praise. I have recently lost several friends. As we age and people pass, we thank God for their being in our lives. Yes. And that these people, without them, we would do nothing. Oh. And they give us a strength, an honor, and a passion that is hard to find. Well, oh, thank you, Susan. Friend. So she has a praise for basically the body of Christ, for the strength we give to one another and the help that we give to one another and how they shape our lives in beautiful and holy ways. And then Steve? Steve's not here, but a praise for his report. Yes, Steve Herringer, yes. Or Herringer. He is... Uh, he is amazing, too. He's getting back a good report. He said he finally thinks he has the cancer on the run. So amazing things are happening. Thank you for praying for, for the family of God here. And uh, we just looked up praises along with you for all the good things that are going on here. Um, are there any other praises or prayer requests? Grace is at the back. Yes, I have prayers for my son, James. Prayers for James. Okay, in the middle of his chemotherapy session. So pray for James that that will be effective. All right, let us, let us pray. Um, Lord God, we just give you praise and thanks um, for all of your goodness, the ways that you display your love for us. We thank you most of all, Lord, for 
the saving grace of Jesus Christ that allows us to come before the throne of grace and lift up our praises and our petitions before you. It's only because of him that we can either gather together today and lift up these praises and prayer requests and know that you hear them. So we give you thanks for Jesus. We give you thanks for the body of Christ that helps us to grow in grace and knowledge. And we lift up, Father, praises for um, Lindsay's surgery and continued recovery. We understand all wisdom comes from you, and the doctors have that wisdom that comes from you in order to give her a new heart and new lung, and we ask for a full recovery. We thank you for Bobby's life, Father, and we pray that you would guard it, protect it, and there would be a good outcome for him as well and for Tom uh, as he continues to undergo tests. I pray, Father, for a good report for all of these folks, and we thank you, Father, for this family of faith that wants to pray. Thank you for Jesus who has taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Worship continues this morning as our ushers come forward to receive our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. And our prayer is that the people of St. Paul uh, will grow in surrender and sacrifice, that we will be a people who give joyfully, recognizing that as a piece of discipleship and obedience. And our prayer is always that the clergy, the staff, the lay leadership of our church, that we might be phenomenal stewards of the many resources with which we have been entrusted, that in all we do, we're always about making the name of Jesus known. The offering prayer is found in the bulletin. Will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O God. You have given Jesus, your only Son, who was made lower than the angels for our sake. With thanksgiving, we give of what you provided, that your will may be done in this world. Give us wisdom and courage to do so. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Now, if you will, please stand as you are able for the reading of God's Word. And our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Hear the word of the Lord for us this day. Don't suppose that I came to do away with the law and the prophets. I did not come to do away with them, but to give them their full meaning. Heaven and earth may disappear, but I promise you that not even a period or comma will ever disappear from the law. Everything written in it must happen. If you reject even the least important command in the law and teach others to do the same, you will be the least important person in the kingdom of heaven. But if you obey and teach others its commands, you will have an important place in the kingdom. You must obey God's commands better than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law obey them. If you don't, I promise you that you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning again, everybody. Before we, we delve into God's holy word, I want to share uh, two quick announcements with you. Um, one is that uh, you might have noticed, uh, some of you might have tuned into the website, and the staff uh, has been working really hard kind of behind the scenes throughout the holidays. Uh, it takes a lot, of, a lot of work to upgrade digital things, and that's not an area of specialty for me at all. So I have no clue what's actually been happening. But I know that they're, it's getting better and that the website, we've kind of addressed some communication things within the church, with the two campuses. We are far from perfecting it, but we are moving in a direction of greater effectiveness and efficiency. I hope you'll notice that in some of our weekly emails and the way that we're kind of making things with the church calendar. Uh, and I just wanted to let you guys know that if you haven't visited the church website in a while, please do. It is and forever shall be a work in progress, but we are grateful to see us moving in a better direction when it comes to communication. And as always, if you're not receiving church emails, let us know. Uh, turn it in the law offering plate, put your email in there. We'd love to add you to that list so that you'll know what's going on. Secondly, uh, the FPR committee met this past Wednesday night in the parlor. Uh, we had a wonderful meeting. Uh, it was uh, fairly short as things are going fairly well, really well with the staff, so we didn't have a whole lot to talk about. But I do want to share with you approval has been made uh, for a new position on the downtown campus, which will be a children's tweens coordinator. It's going to be a part-time position, and we'll see how that grows as this position maybe grows the, the families and the children and the life of our church. We are going to post uh, that probably on Facebook or social media, email maybe Monday or Tuesday. Feel free to share that. If you know of folks who you think would be great candidates to apply, feel free to to encourage them to send that in. It is the SPR's hope that we'll put that out there for maybe two, two and a half, three weeks, see what the applicant pool looks like, and then we'll get some of our downtown SPR members to begin the process of, of interviewing. This is, a, this is, this is, this is great, y'all. I'm thrilled about this. I hope you are as well. This person will be about creating that culture uh, of Christian education and just fun and, and like a great environment uh, on top of what so many of our volunteers have already been doing for years and years, but to have that consistent presence to love on our kids, to be a connectional point for young families, and also to continue empowering those wonderful laity who have been pouring in to the life of our children. So can we give God a hand clap for that? Because I think that's going to be beautiful. Amen. So if you've missed out the past few weeks, we've been kind of walking in the Sermon on the Mount. Many of you are very familiar with the sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Some of you might have never studied it. Some of you may be new to the church. Just to kind of catch you up, this is Jesus teaching the disciples what it means to be like Jesus to the world. And we've read the Sermon on the Mount before, and Jesus gives some pretty strong commandments within there. And some of us have struggled with that from time to time because, I mean, he says some things that, that are really hard to embody. You know, if somebody, if somebody assaults you, turn the cheek. If somebody asks you to carry something a mile, carry it another mile out of serving them. He says to be meek. He says to be, be a peacemaker. He tells us to be salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. He tells us to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And we hear those words and we're like, Jesus, wow, that's a pretty pretty high standard and Jesus is kind of unapologetic as he makes this sermon and he's telling the people for the kingdom to unfold within you 
as well as around you, we have to begin embodying these commandments in particular. And today we're continuing, uh, as Lacey has read in, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. And I've got to be honest with you, today's segment of scripture is hard. It's a hard teaching. I have never preached on this before. I've never heard a sermon on this passage before. I've never sat through a Bible study on this passage before, and it was never really talked about in seminary. So in looking at this, there were a lot of other options that I think we could have delved into, but I thought if we've been on this trajectory with Jesus, why skip over this piece? Why not live into this and see what the Lord has for us today? Lacey read to you straight from Scripture, and today I want to share with you, and I do this from time to time, I'm a big fan of the English Standard Version, which is very much a word-for-word translation of the original language. But from time to time, I like to lean into more of a thought-for-thought understanding of Scripture. And I want to read for you a translation today that comes from the message. Uh, And we're going to read this today. And I hope hearing it in a little bit of a different way will kind of open our minds to, to lean into this and maybe have a little bit of a better understanding about what Jesus is talking about. So, if you will... Allow me, I'm going to read for you this passage from the message. Jesus says, don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish or to destroy the Old Testament, either God's law or the prophets. I've not come here to demolish it. I have come to complete the Old Testament. I'm going to put it all together. I'm going to pull it together in a vast panorama to where you can look from the top of a mountain and see it in every given direction. I added that part. God's law, God's law is more real and more lasting than the stars in the sky or the ground at your feet. Long after the stars burn out and the earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Trivialize even the smallest item in the law, and you will have done this unto yourself. But take it seriously. Show the way for others, and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering into the kingdom. The word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. So in this, this is a difficult teaching, and then there's probably a reason that there's not a lot of sermons on this particular pericope of Scripture, but I, I want you to lean in for a second, because now Jesus has said, you guys are salt. Y'all are the salt of the earth. You're to go out and flavor it, to bring the gospel, to bring souls into preservation, that there may be healing and eternal life might unfold. He said, you guys are the light of the world. Shine your light in the darkness. Never hide it. Always let Jesus be on the tips of your tongues. And may it never be for your glory, but may that glory always be aimed at your Father in heaven. And now he's speaking to the audience, who would be mainly Hebrew and Jewish people, that would have been very well versed, very well versed in the Old Testament. In fact, they would have memorized a vast majority of it. Many of them would have. And he says, don't you think for a second that I've come to do away with the Old Testament? Don't you think for a second that I've come to demolish it? But instead, he says, I have come to fulfill everything the Old Testament says. And I don't know about you, but like sometimes in my own study, sometimes when the lights are off and I'm by myself in prayer, there can be a sprinkle of two of doubt from out in the obscurity that will come and penetrate my mind, and I will begin to wonder. And and you may have a stronger faith in that. Maybe you've never wrestled with this, but I think if we're honest, we can admit we all have. And when I read today's passage and seeing the way that everything in the Old Testament, going back from Genesis through Malachi, literally pointed to the coming of Jesus hundreds and even thousands of years before that first Christmas Eve, that it all pointed to the fact that there was a Messiah and a Redeemer who would come to rescue the people of God. When I hear that and I begin to think about that, it helps to cast out those little inklings of doubt 
that sometimes enter into my mind. When Jesus came down from the transfiguration, he did a healing, and there was a man there that said, Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. And that's been a prayer of mine from time to time. And one of the ways that that unbelief is cast out is when I look at the Old Testament and I see that that Jesus is on every page. That everything within the Old Testament points to the coming of the one who would be the Redeemer. And it brings me hope and it strengthens my faith. And here Jesus is saying to them, what you have been waiting for has come. I didn't come to abolish this. I am the fulfillment of it. It has always pointed to me. The law in all of the brokenness of humanity, you could never live into the guidepost in the law that Moses provided for you to be a holy people. You have failed time and time again. And every time you failed, there was a sacrifice. Every time you failed, there was death. Every time you failed, there was the shedding of blood. He's saying, I have come to complete the law. I have come to be the fulfillment of that sacrifice. You now know from generation to generation to generation that your sin equals death. And I have come to be the final sacrifice, the fulfillment of the law. I, the Lamb of God, have come to die on behalf of the sins of humanity, past, present. In future, Jesus is saying, in me the law has been fulfilled. And when it comes to the prophets, Ezekiel, when it comes to Amos, when it comes to, to Daniel, when it comes to Isaiah and Malachi, Jesus is saying, all of their prophecy pointed to me. I am the one who has come, that has long been promised to the people of God. I don't know about you, but that stirs hope within me. He was making sure they knew. Jesus saying, I hold the Old Testament in the highest of authority. But do know that everything within it points to me coming to be your Redeemer. He says this. He says, look, I need you to know that in me, that there is a new, new way, a new life that is coming that wasn't experienced by your predecessors your forefathers, and your great-great-grandparents. I have now come. You have waited for me, and I am bringing forth life that this world has not seen. And we see in the Sermon on the Mount, and this is so beautiful. He says, if you alter these commandments I'm giving you, he's not talking about the commandments of Moses. I believe he's talking about the commandments that he himself is giving unto the people who were gathered around, that we are called to repent and believe, that we're called to be light in the world, that we're called to be peacemakers, and we're called to carry the coat the extra mile and to turn the cheek, that we're called to be the salt of the earth, that we're called to be a people who seek the Spirit to dwell within us. He's saying if you now neglect these commandments, if you manipulate the words that I'm saying to suit your own interests or your own glory, just as so many before him had. He's saying you will not experience the fullness of the kingdom of God. But those of you who embody this, those of you who lean into this, there is that kingdom that awaits you. But I want you to know this, and I love this about Holy Scripture, and I've experienced this. Some of you, hopefully all of you have as well. Heaven, the kingdom of God, is something we look at awaiting the day that Jesus returns the day that we draw our final breath. We don't know exactly where we end up. We just know that we shall be in paradise where he is. We know that that awaits us at the end. But the beautiful thing about the kingdom of heaven is it is invading earth now through you. And Jesus is saying, as you embody being salt, as you embody being light, as you meet the needs of others, The veil becomes thin as the light of heaven penetrates the darkness of the world. 
and some of you who have done such, whether serving the needs of family or friends or neighbors, some of you who have bent over backwards to empower and meet the needs of the last, the least, and the lost, you were at your very best in those moments. And those were moments when that veil was thin, when the light of Christ was shining through you into the darkness of the world. Jesus is saying this is a new way of embodying the law, for it's embodying the spirit that dwells within you. But one of the biggest, most misunderstood pieces of this particular passage is verse 20, and this is where we're going to kind of land the ship this morning, as we've been true to doing some exegesis and some deep study of these words. Jesus says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. When we hear that, we struggle with that. And let's be honest, you and I have a pretty negative view of the Pharisees. You and I have a pretty negative view of the scribes. We've been conditioned to do so, really, for 2,000 years. The followers of Christ and and Christendom has always had a pretty negative view of the Pharisees, maybe absent of Nicodemus and a couple others. We, We haven't been taught a lot of good things about those guys. But keep in mind, when Jesus said these words, Sermon on the Mount, Pharisees were pretty popular. Like, they had a pretty good reputation. They weren't the Sadducees who were stuck in the temple doing temple things. These were folks who were out amongst the people. You know, they were very well educated. They were present and they were amongst the people. And there was a decent amount of respect. I'm not saying they had like universal 100% approval rating. But for the most part, people looked at them with a little bit of a prestige, with a little bit of elegance, with a little bit of approval and appreciation. And there was something neat about having the Pharisees and For the most part, the common folks like us, they saw them and they thought, man, those guys are pretty cool. You know, they're they're not a whole lot bad about them. That was the typical person looking at them, seeing that they represented the kingdom of God, not knowing the depth of their heart, not knowing the error of their ways, just seeing the visible, the visible side of them in the community. So when Jesus said this, and he said unto them, unless your righteousness unless your right living exceeds that of these people who you hold in the highest of regards, you're never going to enter the kingdom. They would have been like, man, it's really hard to get in there. You know, that's, that's going to be insanely difficult. But within this, and this is where we misinterpret this, and this is where there's some confusion for us in this verse. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is where we close today. You see, the Pharisees, they were great about putting on a front. Jesus really exposed this. This is why we have a negative view of them. They were great about putting on a facade, dressing themselves up so that the general public saw them in a place of power and prestige. They were really great about being a little glory hungry, that people would always see them as great and never see them as anything that had a weakness or a struggle. They wanted to put it on Instagram for all the world to see how beautiful and perfect they were. When, as we often know, behind the camera, behind the cell phone, there's brokenness and tears and struggles, and even sin. They only ever wanted for the world to see what they called perfection, and they manipulated the law of God to build their influence and their power so that people would think they were righteous. But Jesus goes on to tell the Pharisees, you guys, in reality, are whitewashed tombs. You might look good on the outside. The general public might offer you a thumbs up on the approval, but inside you're broken. Inside you're selfish. Inside there is pride that is devouring your soul. Inside there's a lot of work that needs to be done for healing. The Pharisees hated that about Jesus. They hated that about Jesus. So much so that that in combination with the things that Jesus said, which they saw as blasphemy, they wanted him dead to protect their power and their influence 
in the way that things were. And Jesus says, your righteousness has to exceed that of these whitewashed tombs. Jesus is saying in this, and hear me, this is so applicable to you and I. This is so applicable to our lives. The righteousness of the Pharisees was a righteousness of flesh putting perfection on display. It was a righteousness of the flesh being seen in a place of power. It was a righteousness of of the flesh that was always desiring the glory of others. Pharisees was about receiving the glory and living into the moment of others offering them glory. The followers of Jesus, it was about the glory being channeled to our heavenly the Pharisees were about power and influence and always being seen in this position of authority. The followers of Jesus were about falling down upon their knees and washing the feet of others in a place of humility and selflessness. The Pharisees embody the definition of selfishness. The followers of Jesus were to embody the definition of selflessness. One comes from the flesh, and the other comes from the spirit. One is human righteousness. The other is divine righteousness. And divine righteousness does not put itself on display to the world so that it might receive glory. Divine righteousness does not proclaim perfection while everyone else is broken and looked down upon them. Divine righteousness does not manipulate the law of God so that your power and influence is always protected. No, divine righteousness leads you to lay down your weapons and to yield to the power of God within you so that you may do good works and that you may give glory to your Father in heaven. The flesh example of this, the worldly example of this, something we can reach out and touch, Apostle Paul. Everybody knows Paul, big church planner, great, awesome guy. He was a Pharisee. He was one of these guys that was about power and influence and the persona of perfection. Paul very much was a whitewashed tomb who was all about his flesh and his own righteousness. He wanted to be seen as the most knowledgeable, the most law-abiding Pharisee there ever was. And this is what happened on the road to Damascus. He was going to persecute the Christians. You know the story from Acts. And on the way, there was a blinding light and scales came upon his eyes. And through a series of events, Jesus himself spoke to Paul and said, you were going to be my messenger to the Gentiles. And in one of the letters that Paul writes, we're actually studying this in Acts, he writes this to the church. And this is what he says. I want you to hear these words because they speak so much to the difference between human righteousness of the flesh and a divine righteousness of the spirit. He says, I put no confidence in my flesh. And he didn't add this in there, but I want to say this. I don't think we should either. I put no confidence in my arrogance. I put no confidence in my pride. I put no confidence in my persona of perfection. He's saying, I don't put any confidence in anything I do on my own. But he says, though I have reason to, I have reason for confidence in my flesh. Some have a lot. He says, I have reason for even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. He's telling the people, when it came to the law of Abraham, he, he was embodying what God had said. Of the people of Israel, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, a very small, almost exclusive tribe that brought a bunch of prestige to your heritage. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church as to righteousness under the law, as to righteousness of the flesh that made others think I was holier than they could ever be. He says, I was blameless. But whatever gain I had, 
whatever gain the old way of human righteousness had brought my life, I count as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. For his sake, Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things. I've suffered the loss of my reputation. I've suffered the loss of the good standing I had in the community. I've suffered the loss of when I walked into a room, everybody looked at me and thought, how holy and majestic and wonderful is that human being? He's saying, I have lost all of that reputation in order that I might gain Jesus and be found in him, not having any righteousness that comes from my own flesh, but that my righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God. Jesus is telling those who are gathered on this hillside listening to him speak, it's no longer religion. It's about personal relationship. It's no longer about the prestige, but it's about embodying selflessness. It's no longer about what you can do with your hands and where you came from and who your parents were and what they did for a living. It's about surrendering to the Spirit of God who dwells within you so that you might go forth and the light of the kingdom of God might shine into the darkness of the world through your witness and your testimony. That's what Jesus means when he says, unless your way of life exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So when I think about our church and I think about St. Paul being salt. I think about St. Paul being light. I can't help but read this and see a holistic invitation for greater surrender. Because there are those in this space today, sometimes it's me included in that group. Amen? Sometimes it's your preacher included in that group. We want that persona of perfection. We want that persona of having it figured out. We want to be defined by what we can do with our hands. For some of us, it falls into the realm of faith and the way that we serve the church. We want people to know what all we do and how good we are at it. But for others, it even falls into the different vocations that we live in, the different things that we do in our neighborhoods, in the workplace. And we want to be defined by what we do and seek the righteousness of others by our hands. And Jesus is saying, that doesn't matter. Count it loss. Simply surrender to the Spirit of God that dwells within you and live a life honoring God so that heaven invades earth through your witness. And don't seek recognition. Don't seek reputation. Don't seek glory. But instead, in everything that you say or do, channel it to your Heavenly Father so the world comes to know the name of Jesus and so that your name is for God. Amen. Do it so that the name of Jesus is known and your name is forgotten. Amen. That's what it means to be light. That's what it means to be salt. And that's what it means for us to embody divine righteousness, the righteousness of God. I'm going to offer a prayer as the choir begins to lead us in our closing hymn. And I want you to know that today, as any day, at all times throughout our service, the altar is open for those who would like to come and pray. Maybe it's a prayer of confession today. Maybe it's a prayer of acknowledging pride and selfishness and arrogance. Maybe it's a prayer on behalf of others. Maybe it's just a general prayer for a revival and awakening within our church. This morning, the altar is open. Sing with all your hearts as the choir leads us. And if you need to come forward and pray... Come and pray, and may God be glorified as you seek more of him. And all God's children said together, Amen. Let's turn to page 60 in our Cokesbury hymnal. More like the master I would ever be. Let's stand together as we sing verses 1 and verses, well, let's just do all three of them. It, that looks, sounds like it's very appropriate. <laughs>
I want to give you uh, just two quick announcements before we leave. Um, I'll be gone next weekend. Uh, I am, I've been asked to be the keynote speaker at a retreat at Camp Wesley Pines. Some of you are familiar. And we're going to have a couple hundred uh, junior high students that will be there for confirmation. And I'll be there throughout the entirety of the weekend. So I will miss you on Sunday morning. Uh, I will miss you guys uh, as we serve communion uh, out, at, out, at the, out at the home. And I'll also miss you at the United Methodist uh, Women's Fellowship on, on Sunday. So I, I hate that I won't be here for that. But I will be around energetic students that will be running everywhere. And it will be a phenomenal time. Also know that as Lent is, is rapidly approaching. Um, I want you guys to know that, that we're planning on having uh, four Lenten luncheons that will all be here in the month of March in the Weston building. Uh, and some of you, I know, want to help out with that. We're looking at soups and sandwiches. If you or a group of ladies or men or whomever want to be a part of uh, helping that happen, shoot me an email or, or let the church know. and we'll, we'll be reaching out to talk about that as we plan in the upcoming months. As you go today, may you go in peace. And as you go... Give a hug to somebody standing around. Just shake their hand and welcome them into our church. And may we seek the righteousness of Christ in all we do. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.